Hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design. Today, we're talking about the power of design to influence everyday lives in positive and profound ways as we celebrate 15 years of the Shaw Contract Design Awards. Wow. And I have two very special guests and dear friends, John Stevens, VP of Marketing for Shaw Contract, and Ken Wilson, Principal of Perkins & Will, who has been both a judge and a winner. We'll hear about that. Hi, guys. Hey, Cindy. Hi, Ken. Hi, Cindy. How are you? It's great to see you. How are you guys doing? Like, really well in global pandemic-adjusted terms. We're <laughs> doing fantastic. Exactly. exactly. All right, well, let's, let's talk about some good news, because 2020 is a lot of things, but it's also the 15th year of the Shaw Contract Design Awards. John, that is quite a feat. You know, it, it's kind of hard to believe, especially from where the program started and, and sort of the germ of an, of an idea of a way to celebrate design and be able to see projects really initially mostly from the U.S., but it's turned in certainly to a global program that allows us to celebrate designers and, and work from around the globe, but also see work from around the globe. Right. I always say, like, you, you work on these projects uh, in terms of getting, getting the goods, right, getting the carpet to projects all around the world. You ne don't necessarily get to see the finished projects, so it must be amazing for you guys. It's really, it is, it's really great. And I will say when the program, when all the projects are in, where the call for entry is complete, we end up spending like 24 hours, two or three days in a row, just really excited to see all the projects. We're texting back and forth. Have you seen you know, this Perkins and Will entry or this Gensler entry or, you know, firms that we really get excited about the work they do. And it, it, it is kind of, you know, Christmas day over and over again when we get to go through all the projects and see the creative ways people are using the Shaw contract to make their visions come alive. Yeah, tell us, um, John, like where it started and how big it's actually become. Yeah, I will say I was thinking about this this week, Cindy. The first idea for the program, I was actually in Nick Lazzetti's office. Oh my God, VOA. In VOA. And Nick told me, he said, we love it when you guys come in and show us your new products. But what we really love to see are projects that other people have done. And when we look at them, we'll make fun of them, but afterwards we'll steal their ideas, right? So, you know, very <laughs> Nick. Uh, but the, that, so that, that was almost the, the germ of how would we do that? One, be able to see work, but also emerged into how would, you know, how do we sub celebrate that? So the first year we actually worked with Bruce Mao and Bruce Mao Design, who really helped us design the soul of the program, what it looked like. Right. Um, and I think the first year we had probably a hundred entries, uh, almost all of them from the U.S. and Canada. Um, and this you know, last year we had, I think, over 700 entries from 35 countries. So it has changed in, in scope and scale, but at its core, it's still a way for us to celebrate not just the work, but the people who are doing that work and the impact it has. Absolutely. I mean, the global perspective, I always say that when you – when you realize that you're touching people all over the world, that's when you have an amazing idea, right? Yeah. And Ken, and, and, so you were a judge early on, huh? Yes, I was. I was. John called me up and said, would you like to uh, fly out to Napa Valley and uh, judge this design awards we're doing? And, and I, I was uh, not, it was a kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> so... Uh, they, they treat the judges very nicely, I have to say. And, uh, and it was great, but what was really interesting to me is to see the development of this award. It did start out small with uh, like 100 entries, as John was saying. Uh, but now it's grown into a really uh, totally legit, you know, global design award. And as a matter of fact, my, um, my colleague in London was on the jury last year. And so not only is it, it, it's truly an international award because the jury comes from all over the world. So that's, that's really great. I mean, hands off to you, John. I mean, you've done a, a fabulous job with this. And John, um, now with what we're going through in the pandemic, I imagine there's more virtual 
for this year. But that, you know, creates opportunity for you guys too in terms of judging, right? Yeah, you know, early on, we debated whether we should skip a year. And we, no, we, no. we talked about that for about a minute. <laughs> and then uh, people on our team, actually Natalie Jones, who's our marketing director, said more than ever, we need to celebrate design. And we need to get have you know, for ourselves and our community more reasons to celebrate and appreciate the work's doing. So uh, we started rethinking how we would do it. Yeah, because we can't bring judges to one location, whether it's Napa or New York or, or Atlanta, where we've done it. Um, but it did open up new opportunities. We're actually going to have 24 judges on the panel this year, uh, connecting all over the globe in different time zones to be able to bring people together. Um, one, to have a range of people looking at work in different perspectives from uh, the kinds of firms and the kinds of work they do and geographic perspectives at level of diversity, but also expand the community, which part of the, that's been an important part of this award is not only the community of winners, but the community of, 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 of judges who be able to connect to each other from, from all over the world. Right, and you know, at the end of the day, it's all about design, which is why I was so excited when you wanted to do this program together and you brought Ken on, because we always want to have that kind of representation at always, right? So, so Ken, you are so, I understand you were entry number five. The first, the first winning project was the headquarters for the IIDA, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and that was that was a great project for us. First of all, we were super honored to be selected by uh, IDA, and and uh, it it was one of those projects that took a while. We um, started in one place and moved to another, different locations in the Mart. Uh, and um, we, so it was over, over a, uh, a period of three different presidents of the IDA, but, but they were wonderful and sympathetic to work with at the same time. But that was a great project. And uh, it was the, also the first um, uh, design association headquarters to uh, become LEED certified at the time. And so uh, that was a big deal. Uh, and we're very proud to do that project. Yeah, when, when was that? How far back was that? I want to say, was it 2008, John? Uh, I think it was. Probably Sounds like a so dozen yeah. years ago. They're in a new space now, of course. Yeah. Todd Heiser did that space and he did a wonderful job. Yeah, you're, you're so lovely, Ken. Honestly, <laughs> you're like the nicest guy ever. Uh, but, but also, let's not forget the fact that you really were and are a pioneer, but you were a pioneer when it wasn't cool to be sustainable, you were you were on you were had that mission, and you also were designing projects that looked really good, that were sustainable. Which back then we didn't have the kind of products that we have available now. So that's saying a lot. And hats off to you. Well, thanks very much, Cindy. Yeah, there were there were very few uh, really truly green projects back 20 years ago when we started doing this and and when i uh, prior to joining Kirk as well i had my own firm in vision and uh our first project as a firm back in 1999 was to do the headquarters for greenpeace that used shaw carpet and uh because in looking at all the flooring materials shaw had a really good product and it passed the greenpeace muster uh, and so John and I go back at least that far, right, John? It's been yeah. at least 21 years now. Wait, right? John, that, so that was a big project for you to score, right? Oh, it was a big celebration to be able to work, uh, be involved in the Greenpeace headquarters and really the message that sent about our commitment you know, to sustainability and cradle to cradle and, and to work with Ken. It was, yeah, it was pretty awesome. You want to hear something crazy, John? Greenpeace is still in their space and that carpet is still on the floor and it still looks pretty good. That's okay, amazing. Here's the, big, here's the big test. What carpet was that? I can tell you what it was. It was our collection Green with Envy. Uh, <laughs> no, I remember it very Thank you, John, because I, I did not remember that. <laughs> you passed the test, John. That's amazing. You don't forget projects like that, right? No, you absolutely do not. I can tell you what carpet was in the IDA headquarters. Um, what carpet? What carpet? It was our collection silk. Ah, yeah. nice. Yeah. 
No, I still remember the, the elevator on the fifth floor opening up for the first time there in the Mart at IDA and seeing it and being, we were all incredibly proud to be, to be a part of that work. Yeah, by the way, okay, it's a long time ago now, but that was a big deal. That project was a big deal, which we published, by the way. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Cindy. Yes, yeah, so you, okay, so you were a judge and then you won for, you were with Envision when you won the IIDA. Um, yes. The award, and then another project, Nixon Peabody. So tell us about that. Um, well, Nixon was a great project. It, we had a, they were a fantastic client. And uh, one thing that was interesting about that project is the client, the managing director of the DC office of Nixon Peabody was an old friend of mine. He was, uh, he's lived across the street from me for 20 years. Oh, really? <laughs> So we're good friends. We've gone on vacation together and he's just a wonderful guy. I never thought he'd ever be a client, but you know, he ended up being a client. And so we did that project and he was very interested in green. Believe it or not, he was a, a, a lead accredited lawyer, if you can believe that. Oh, and, uh, interesting. and a guy that's very interested in, in, in design and, and uh, he had a daughter that studied design anyway. So they were a great client and uh, that was a wonderful project. And, you know, what I think is interesting is that, you know, with the Shaw contract award, you know, we were, when we enter those things, we're always a little bit worried that we're showing photographs of, of parts of our project and not all of them have Shaw carpet in them, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we're always a little concerned about that. Like, like Nixon had a beautiful wood floor in their reception area and some of those real kind of money shots. And of course, Eric Laniel photographed everything beautifully. Amazing, amazing. Uh, and, um, but, uh, but really that's not part of it, which is really nice, you know? I mean, the, the project needs to have shot carpet somewhere. And it did a lot of it in the, you know, in the office areas and things. But, uh, but I thought that that was, that's a very nice thing like that, that Shaw does, you know, that, that it's really more about the design and, and less about necessarily present our carpet well, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about the whole, right? It's about absolutely, the yeah, yeah. It and, really is. And so, so John, uh, why why did those projects win? Why did Ken's projects win? Yeah, I I think back in how the jury talked about it. One, it was really unexpected for a law firm. Um, that how open it was, the fact that they, you know. Um, created real public space and in, in, in a, a space there where events could happen. It really was open and connected to the community. But I mean, the level of finishes were fantastic. And I think right. everyone appreciated that. But I think the, the innovative approach to a law firm and the way a firm engages, not just with their clients, with the community and how well executed it, it, it was, was, uh, uh, and the fact that it was sustainable and, and the work that Ken and, and the Perkins Will team did on that. Yeah. yeah, it was a lead so, platinum project too. It was, and and also we we had a big party there. Yes, you did. Yeah. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. I remember that. Yeah, so you do have you do have projects that like resonate in a way that are really special, and so I guess it goes both ways. Like Shaw, you want to celebrate that too, so it's amazing that that he's submitting the, that project and that in the same way you're getting honored. So Ken, as a firm, like why do you enter competitions? Well, really at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's really for our staff, you know, I think, because I can't honestly say that we win clients because of design awards, because even, you know, even then though it might be published in a magazine or get some press in the, design community, our, our clients really don't follow that or, or see that so much. Uh, but what's really great about it is that, you know, the team puts in a lot of effort and to have a project that's at the, you know, a, a global design award level, right. you really have to get everything right. And it's a lot of work and you can't, um, and, and it just, it does, doesn't just happen, you know, you have to work. Right really hard on it. And sometimes, you know, it goes really well up until the end and then the client gets a little crazy and then, you know, it doesn't happen. But, um, but it's really about uh, 
about our staff and it's, it's really good for morale, obviously. Uh, when you win a design award, it's great for recruiting. Uh, most young designers, uh, the talent wants to work in award-winning design firms. Right. And so really it's a combination of those things, but it's really about, about our staff at the end of the day and, and always making, you know, giving, giving them credit for, for the hard work that they do. Hey, you want to, you definitely want to do that. And then John, you must learn a lot about, about the carpet and the collections themselves. And even maybe there are some surprises that you guys don't expect it, to understand about what's getting specified, how, where, all of that. Yeah, I mean, we definitely learn a lot about that in unexpected ways. And, and it really has informed you know, our design team. You, you know, Reese Duncan, who's our bleeds yeah, design for Shaw Contract is amazing. But I mean, we'll get insights into how people are using things that are surprising to us. And, and it literally has changed the way we design product based on you know, the, those applications and the creativity our clients are, are using and how they're putting materials together in really unexpected ways. Yeah. So, okay. So I want you to think back to, I don't know, give me a fun story, a fun antidote about uh, some of the past judging. Can you think of any? Yeah. yeah. So I'll give you um, <laughs> definitely who the jury is. We take, we spend a lot of time trying to put together a jury that's going to work together that yeah. brings insights into projects. So when they're judging the work, whether it's different size firms, different geography or different, you know, focuses a practice. Um, and also the moderators play a big role in, and we've, we've spent, had an amazing group of moderators from, you know, John Peterson from, public architecture in Harvard, uh, to you know, uh, Susan Sanazi, to Mark McMiniman from Material Design. Hey. But one year, uh, John Kerry uh, was a moderator. And obviously, John has done a lot of work in writing about the social impact of design. And one of the projects that won that year was Dress for Success. So it was a tiny little pro bono project. Um, but the way that the jury looked at that work and the story behind it and to see them get so excited about this is what inspires us as designers. It maybe is not a huge budget. It maybe is not something that is going to be published all over the world, but something that has an impact on people's lives. And the designer who did that with a no budget with pro bono materials did amazing work. It was beautiful. I mean, it, it uh, certainly, uh, that's almost a baseline. It's got to be beautiful, but it told such a rich story. It was, uh, it was really gratifying to see a project like that be rewarded. That was that was a non for profit right uh, mm -hmm. organization, and the designer was Cynthia Irvine in Cherry, yes. I believe. Yeah. Right? Where was that out of? So it was out of the uh, North Carolina. I think it was in Charlotte. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's nice when judges kind of rally around an mm -hmm. idea and then they get really excited about it and then they they see it in something and something it's like that one was a treasure right like a little treasure yeah and it's you know, there was another project was interesting again it's how you put together a jury it was a senior living facility and some of the judges were commenting it feels disjointed spaces don't feel connected to each other it was almost like a different designer worked on different parts of the community uh -huh. and but there's what a, there, was a, what there was a judge who that's what she did. She was specialized in senior living. And she said, OK, people live most of their lives in this community. So it's very intentional to have spaces that were different spaces that created a different vocabulary, a different language. So it felt like that they were having the active lives and maybe traveling like they did earlier. And all that happened in that single community. So again, it. Uh, to, to have that level of expertise and that conversation and really the passion about recognizing people's work was, was pretty exciting and gratifying to see. And then it ended up winning, right? It ended up winning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the power of the jury. <laughs> yes. But it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there was another beautiful project, uh, the Hugh and Cole, the infusion center project. And that was a great story too, because um, again, the, the, the impact that designers have on people's lives. So in that, in that project, they were really intentional not to use the same color, texture, pattern in the infusion area that they used in the, the doctor's office space. So when the patient would come back to meet with the doctor, there was no, nothing that reminded them 
uh, maybe the negative experiences after infusion. So it's just that thoughtful detail that the UN Cole team applied to that work and thinking about how it, it you know, impacted the people who were going to be in that space and their quality of life. Yeah, no, and and we know that how important it's so funny that you're talking about a couple of like healthcare to wellness, sustainability, all those things that we're going to be talking about even more in yeah, the future. Yeah, but yeah. I do love and and from my own opinion also when judging competitions, just seeing seeing the wide range, seeing the breadth. And uh, there was a little Nando Central Kitchen that also won. Yeah, that was um, a project in South Africa. And it was an amazing example of how the design team pulled culture, the art, and all the furniture. And it was really spoke to uh, that sense of local design, where sometimes you see projects that could be, in, you know, they could be anywhere. That spoke very specifically to the location and, and, the, and the people that were um, that were bringing their different perspectives and points of view to that work. So that, I, I think it was really great to celebrate, celebrate a sense of place. Yeah, I love that. I love that about that project. But, so let's talk about, let's talk about 2020. So it's a completely different perspective. I am so glad that you were doing it and not saying, you know, not, you know, falling prey to COVID. So tell us about the judging and the timeline and, what it's going to look like. Yeah, so the call for entry is open now, and it'll be open through, uh, I think, through the second week of October. And then we'll be doing judging because it is all virtual. The first round of judging, which, what, uh, which they'll select projects in each market segment. So the winner and uh, the best projects in a uh, small office or healthcare or senior living. Uh, and then those winners become the finalists for the overall competition, which will be selected in November and announced by the end of the year. So it's on. It's going to be on, right? It, it is totally on. And, and it's, again, we're spending, uh, we've spent a lot of time selecting judges that could work together, that bring a diversity of points of view. Uh, and it's going to be you know, different than any year in the past. So having you know, a, 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 a jury from a panel from Asia that's connecting to a panel from the West Coast US. So those judges will work together and review work. Again, they have that global point of view and perspective, and, and I can't wait to see how those conversations happen and what that you know what the results of that are. Yeah, Ken, it must be a completely different experience when you you know you submit and let it let go of it and see what comes back, as opposed to when you're a judge, right? Oh yeah, for sure it is. Um, I I think I think actually one of the challenges this year for any design competition is just that it's just much harder to photograph a project, right? Like everybody wants to see the work that you did in the last 12 months or six months or something like that. And uh, obviously in the last six months, it's been a challenge to photograph. I mean, we are still uh, attempting just now to, to photograph some stuff, but it's, but, it's, but it's a challenge. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I think, in the future, uh, depending on how long, long all this lasts, there might need to be an extension on, you know, when you submit a project, because a lot of the, like, I'm not sure, it, it's gotta be less than two years old or something like that. Mm -hmm. John, I forget, something like that. Yes, yeah. within the last two years, yeah. So that, that's, that's a challenge for us, you know, and also, you know, you wanna get people in your photographs, right? And that, you know, it's just a, uh, a challenge to do that. Yeah, we'll learn. We'll definitely. Yeah, learn. no, we absolutely will learn. Yes. Yeah, I know Eric's out there shooting. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, and we're having projects delivering. You know, they're delivering, but there uh, a lot of them that are delivered recently in the last couple months are, are a lot of them are just sitting idle. Really, they haven't had anybody really come in yet. But uh, we're looking forward. We're going to get through this. We're going to. Yeah, we're going to get through this. Okay, John, like a favorite memory from the last 15 years of the Shaw Contract Design Awards? Wow, that is so tough. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think it probably would, um, maybe some of the early, early years where we were working on the program and it began to grow and some of the judging that we did because, you know, we've had such, you know, we've had people like Ken Wilson, uh, we've had Karen Daroff, we've had, you know, 
uh, Jim Looney, uh, Ellen Albert from MTV Viacom. So we've had these amazing group of people. And I think for me, maybe it's building that community of, of, of friends now who are in the profession that uh, we've built that network and, um, and just watching the, how passionate they were about the judging. There's been no physical violence yet. It's been all, you know, but, the, but it really gets intense. Again, they're very invested in the year they're judging that the projects they select represent the best of global design that year and almost their point of view uh, of what design is. And, and so I think those, you know, probably just the connections and relationships through the years of the judging and the, and the network we've developed. Yeah, I think, and Ken, I think you were saying that too. It is, it is about, it is about community. Some of it is, some of it is about your own staff and and putting it out there for you, John, is seeing the work and having that community of designers and the jury uh, is really is really exciting. So so how do, are people still submitting and how do they do that? Yes. Yeah, so you go to shawcontract.com and uh, the design award page will, will be right on the home page to submit. It's really easy. Uh, and if you have any, any challenges, you can contact us on the website. We're happy to reach out to the firm and walk you through making sure your project is submitted. And best of luck to everybody. And Ken, are you guys submitting? <laughs> you know, that's, that's the next one on our list. So we'll have to, we'll have to look and, and look at our projects and see which one you saw. But I'm sure, I think just about all of them do. We have an excellent rep in, in D.C. <laughs> So, well, there you go. Well, uh, Melinda, Melinda, but anyway, we're uh, uh, we will we will definitely submit something. Well, first of all, congratulations on 15 years of the Shaw Contract Design Awards. That's a big deal, and I know because we've developed and grown a lot of awards. That once it's real, you you really know it, and the industry knows it, and now the world knows it, John. So we're really excited to support you and celebrate you and really celebrate great design. Yeah, th thank you. And it's, it's um, I mean, it is a passion of our brand and it's so key to our culture and our ethos. And we cannot wait to see all the projects from around the globe that get entered this year. There you go. So don't forget, what, what's the deadline? Uh, second week in October. Second week of October, go to shawcontract.com. That's it. Yeah, go to Shaw, and you'll see it. You'll see it. Submit your best, and who knows? You might win. You just might win. So thank you so much, Ken. Congratulations on all your success and everything you do for the industry to move us forward. I really appreciate you as a person, as a designer, as an advocate for sustainability and all those good things. And John, um, our relationship and partnership carry on and we're so proud to be part of any of the collaborations that you do because you mean so much to us so go forth and design everybody and let's get past this darn thing right amen <laughs> and celebrate celebrate great design that's what it's all about I'm Jacqueline Terrebone, the Editor-in-Chief of Gallery Magazine, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Nancy Epstein, the CEO and founder of Artistic Tile. Artistic Tile has so much in common with Gallery because we both really appreciate and love art. And what I consider that they do at Artistic Tile really is art, the quality, the beauty, the innovation. It really is inspiring. So Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me and thank you for that beautiful introduction. And we do believe the tile is art. It's the art that really lasts and stays with you for a long time. It's so true. Once you put that tile in, it is there to to see, it's there. And worship, and admire for centuries. And I love that what you do at Artistic Tile also, like you realize that tile is there to last 
and it goes beyond trends. I don't see something that's just following the latest color, the latest this or that from you. It, it really is always something that comes from a deep artistic inspiration. That's very true. One of the words I detest when it comes to tile products is the word trends. And I really dislike it because when you're designing for a bathroom or a kitchen, you're designing for at least 20 years. I mean, in my own house, I have bathrooms, but they're 35 years old. I mean, you don't want something that somebody's going to walk into your house and say, hmm, 2005, I can see it in there. You want something that's going to start being fresh and end being fresh. You don't want to tire of these products for the entire time they're in. These are products that are normally installed once, maybe twice in a person's lifetime. They're products of enduring value and should be looked at that way. Right. It's not a throw pillow. It's not a lamp. It's not an accessory on the table. It really is there, you know, for a long time in the home. It is. And the installation part of it is usually more expensive than the product itself or on the same level as it. So the best thing for people to do, especially if they want to be green, is to pick a product that they not like, but that they love mm -hmm. and that they invest in it so that they never wish to replace it. Well, what I've been finding a lot in designers I've been talking through during these times where people are at home is that they're really looking at their homes as more of an escape and your bathroom is now your spa and your home bar is now, you know, the cocktail lounge you used to go to in your kitchen is basically that um, that restaurant where you can see the chef, but the chef is you. Are you finding that um, clients and people who are interested in Tyler looking to upgrade those particular spaces right now? We really are. It goes back to 9-11 when people first really got the feeling that home was a refuge. Thanks to shelter magazines like Gallery, for the past 30 years, homes have really increased importance to the consumer. But in a time like this, where you're really not going out, people are stopping and thinking, this is the first major pause we've ever had in travel. I mean, after 9-11, we may not have traveled for a month, but we're going on months without traveling, and people are vacationing in their home. And they're there all day, and their office is there, and their family's there, and they understand and they see the importance and you know from everything bad something good happens and i think people are reflecting more on their values i think they're thinking more about being green and i think they're realizing that they have to treasure their home and along with that comes the importance of their art and their design and the way it feels to them because your environment really does change the way you feel if you ever traveled to some of the horrible hotels I've had to stay at in Italy, you'd totally get that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting you mentioned your travels to Italy because what I find is so fascinating to always speak with you about is your inspiration and how you come up with so many interesting and varied tiles. And then, you know, where does that process take you? Where does that begin for you? Well, if I bounce back 30 years ago, we could go to a tile show and get inspired. It's been about 20 years since we could get inspired at a tile show. <laughs> uh, at a tile show, we feel like bringing a legal team these days because oh of the amount of people that copy us and, and uh, take inspiration from our copyrighted patterns. But at any rate, to get inspired, we travel. I mean, Jill Cohen, who's our design director, and I really do travel the world not only in search of suppliers and manufacturers that can make the products that we dream of, but for inspiration. If we go to a new city, we take a tour. We go to the museums, we go to the galleries, we go to the art shows. We don't go to tile shows for inspiration. We go to tile shows to purchase commodity that we have to have and to meet our suppliers and say hello. But the rest of the world is open to us. I get more out of Salone de Mobile than I get out of a tile show. And I get more out of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York than I would going to the coverings show in the United States. So we travel and history is our inspiration and everything we do is really rooted in some way or another 
with things that were in the past. So what are some of those places that you've tried? I just imagine you in Italy walking around with your phone, looking down and taking pictures of tiles everywhere. Where have you traveled? It's not just that? tiles. It's, yeah. it's, it's the railings. It's the doorways, the entrances. It's in Europe, thank God, it's the ceilings. I mean, the ceilings uh -huh. are always so fascinating. I don't know why in antiquity, and I never got this answer, the ceilings were always fabulous. And in today's world, we rarely ever detail a ceiling. Do you know why that is? I don't know. I, I would think it would have like some sort of religious, like looking up to God, like that would yeah, be but my guess. That's, but, that's um, what I guess too. But that is so true. We really just sort of paint it white. Maybe if you're lucky, it's a color. But other than that, not that kind of detailing, the mural art, the intricate painting that there really once was there and the woodwork too. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you told me there's been um, tiles you've done, like Forte de Marmi has been an inspiration for you. Well, Forte de Marmi is the city, it's the Fort of Marble. It is the city next to Carrara, Italy, where the blocks of slabs used to come down from the mountains to be shipped across the world. The interesting thing about traveling, and when I show you some of the slides, you'll see, is how you can tell the history of the world by the stones that were there. You can see all the trade routes of antiquity because you'll see which stones and from what countries they were. So you'll understand that that civilization traded. And you'll also find that in any dig, as they go down through the layers of civilization, at the bottom of it will be the marble mosaics because they survived the earthquakes, they survived the wars, all of the buildings just fell down on top of them, layer after layer, civilization after civilization. They didn't have backhoes, they didn't have excavators. They just pushed everything down, used what they could and rebuilt with it. For example, when you're in San Marco in Venice and you go into the floors, which were all done in the Cosmati areas, uh, inspired by the Cosmati brothers, you see a lot of circles and you say, how did they do these precise circles in antiquity? They didn't have a water jet machine, which is what we use to cut a precise circle today. And they did it because they were taking columns that had collapsed and they were slicing the columns and reusing them. E everything had a reason and a purpose. And it's just, we'll go through the slides and you'll see how these things evolved. I think Italy and Israel are the two most inspiring countries only because of the amount of Roman antiques that you can find there. The antiquities are just everywhere. The floors, the patterns, the mosaics. It's amazing to see. I remember once about 25 years ago, the client said to me, when do you think glass tile will go out of style? So I picked, pulled out a picture of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for them. And I said, I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime. I mean, it's kind of been... <laughs> style forever. I don't think this is trendy. So, right. And then when clients say, oh, here's, here's a replica of a floor from San Marco, that's too modern for me. I say, really? That's so interesting. Pattern's about 900 years old and you feel it's modern and that's great. That is great. That's very special. So Nancy, what I love is that you really find inspiration out in the world and then translate it into great, amazing artistic tile products. So what are some of the, what are some of those things that you've seen that have directly, you know, become reality? Well, one of my favorite things to do because I am ridiculously passionate about products and history and how we find things and how we develop it is I love traveling with architects and designers or coworkers and taking them to places of inspiration. So mm -hmm. one of my favorite places is a Roman city in Israel that was destroyed by an earthquake really around the same time as Vesuvius called Beit Sha'an. And the first place I'd like to take people is an area where all different columns have collapsed. Why there? Because when you look at each column, you can look at all the different marbles that have fallen down and you can see the trade routes of antiquity. And it's just amazing to see that here we have some stone from Greece, some stone from Turkey, some stone from Italy, some stone from Egypt. And 
the rest of the trip just becomes such a fabulous journey of discovery. That's great. And then what are some other products that have been inspired by your travels? Well, this is, I went on, we went on a trip to Barcelona a few years ago and we were in one of the Gaudi buildings and I just loved the wood floor. So mm. we reinterpreted the wood floor into a marble floor and came up with a, a pattern that we thought really spoke to today. That's great. I love that it's not just the tile or the marble influence you. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. This is um, the Victoria and Albert Museum, as most great museums in the world, is built with stones of antiquity. This particular stone is uh, Brescia Capraia, is what we call it today. We used to call it Brescia Imperiale. And it really relates to one of my favorite stories of all my travels. In 2004, I just, I was dying to get back some antique stones. Mm -hmm. So I was going to a trip to Italy. I alerted all of my different vendors across the country what I was looking for. And I brought my cousin Lauren, who's the president of the retail showrooms, along with me. Now, Lauren studied in Italy when she was in school. She spent a semester in Florence. So we wanted to end, we had Monday through Friday to search for stone, and we wanted Saturday off in Florence. And then Sunday we were going to fly out from Verona because when we were planning, we didn't really know where we would be. And we crisscrossed the country of Italy back and forth and back and forth looking at stone after stone after stone, and nothing was right. Nothing just hit it. Nothing just had a touch of purple in it. Nothing sang to me. So it was Friday night, it was getting dark. I was back in the Forte de Marmi region, the Carrara region, really getting desperate because I had probably seen 500 different stones across the country and nothing worked. <laughs> we went, uh, my supplier, Matteo, said to me, you know, there's an old stone depot. I think what you're looking for is an antique stone. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so we went there and with the headlights of his car, because it got dark, he put those lights on the old blocks and I said, that's it, perfect. Cut it into 16 by 16, hone it and I'll take it. He said, you don't want samples? I said, nope, it's perfect. And that was our introduction of, Bre our introduction of Brescia Imperiale. Fresh Imperiale really hadn't been quarried in a long time, nor had many of the more active stones, stones that are brecciated, that were at the upper levels of the quarries that had been removed in the antiquity. And most of them were, were put into great monuments, great buildings. They didn't have equipment to dig deeper and get the stones that are more common today. And most of them were basically gone. So once we started with Brescia Imperiale, which is what we called it because we couldn't say the name that they gave the stone, the whole activity and the search for these more exciting stones came about in the entire industry. And now we're seeing more and more love by people of these stones of antiquity that have a lot of movement and a lot of action that are incredible as book match slabs on walls and I just love seeing that resurgence of interest into the stones to that to me as a stone lover really speak stone. Yeah, I, I find that the designers, architects, they, they love it. They love the power. They love the statement it makes. And then also that there's a history, you know, it, it's not a trend, but there's definitely the love of that deep veining and the interesting colors coming back. And I, I couldn't think it's more beautiful absolutely amazing. It is. Then on one trip, I stayed in the renovated Gritty Palace, and I was put into this fabulous room filled with Cipollino marble. Now, in the 80s, we sold a lot of Cipollino marble, but I had been unable to find it again. Nobody mm -hmm. seemed to have it. I stayed in this suite, and they had Cipollino. I said, if they found it, we can find it. And we did. So today, Cipollino is back in our offerings, and it's an exciting, warm stone that just, it speaks of today like it spoke of yesterday. And I'm, I'm glad to see the, that the um, quarries have reopened the areas where this material is found. That's great. And then it's not always about the veining, though. Sometimes there's pattern going on. 
as well. Yeah, I mean, Cipollino has incredible patterning. And again, the color is just so soft and so nice and so delicious. But when you think of patterns, patterns can be an inspiration too. Mm -hmm. So walking down the street in Florence on the way to the um, Duomo, there's this little recessed niche that I just love. And I always looked at the, the blue background with the gold stars. I happen to love blue and I'm really, really fond of gold. And we came up with the idea for what we call constellation. So it's sort of like a night sky where if you look closely at, at the pattern, it almost looks like it's pulsing. I love that. And then the Duomo. Uh -huh. and then the Duomo. Everybody goes to the Duomo in, in um, Venice. The Duomo is just the most beautiful, exciting floors for any stone lover in the world. Nothing can compare to it. They this were not a, shy with those floors. They were not shy. And I've got to tell you, I really try to go and revisit these every year because every year I see something different. And nothing here has ever gone out of, as we spoke before, out of trend. Everything here is really forever. So the pattern that we call Doge is just a straight influence from here, just right along the line. Here is our pattern called Duomo. So it's actually not a Duomo. They don't call San Marco a Duomo. I've never quite understood that distinction. Do you? No, I don't know the reason for that, but I will look it up. I've looked it up and I've learned it a lot of times. I just can't ever remember it. Something oh. is a Duomo, <laughs> something is a cathedral, and San Marco is just San Marco. Okay. Um, but it's not just antiquities. We go to shows that are current. So at Salone de Mobile, I saw this really interesting, beautiful wallpaper on a wall in a store. And that became the inspiration for our echo glass pattern. And we loved our echo glass pattern so much, we said, we need to make this in stone. So we did echo glass, which is only suitable for walls, not floors. And then we did a stone, stone version also, so that if you love the pattern, you could walk on it as well. That's great. There's one that you have that has a fan that I, I think is great. It has a very gilded age flair to me. It does. And fans, fans have been around since antiquity. There's the fans on the floors in Beit Sha'an. There is actually no ruin or no street in Europe that you won't find with the fan pattern because the fan pattern was created by men laying paving stones. They were on their knees and the fan pattern was the reach of their arms in subsequent yeah. movements. So the fan pattern we've had in various versions throughout the years. Our current ombre uh, fan club is a subtle blend of colors with a, a touch of metal. That's a great we happen to be huge ombre fans. And it's just so funny that ombre came about and then during COVID it was tie-dye. And I don't know why I think tie-dye and, and ombre are so much alike, but I think there's a strong relationship between that movement of colors that people find so fascinating. Yeah, the fading in and out. I like how you also pull from nature. You know, sometimes there are shapes of nature that reflect back to the tiles. Those are beautiful too. So our pattern called foliage. Foliage, the shape of that leaf, we've used in so many different patterns. So we just took one shape and we've used it to create foliage and to create something called astrea. And it's just a pattern that gets used a shape that gets used over and over, and it's based upon the shape of a leaf. Beautiful, because it can be graphic, but it's organic. It, it really has all of those elements. What's really interesting about when we do foliage in the glass tile is with glass, the color of the grout that's around it totally changes the appearance of the glass. So when you use different grout colors, you create a completely different look to the point people think it's a different product. 
they're astonished that it's the same product. When I think of grand hotels, mm -hmm. I think of these great mosaic floors. I think of going on the grand tour of Europe in the 1920s and seeing these fabulous hotels. But even those fabulous hotels took their tricks of the trade from antiquity. So going through an old mosaic book, I found a reference to a pattern we called Grand Hotel. We actually saw it, a version of it in a Grand Hotel. But it's so interesting to put the history together because there's really nothing new under the sun. It's just how do we create it? What colors do we put it in? How do we make it better for today than it was in the past? So designing for our products, it's, it's a real combination of technology, stones, design, inspiration, and history. And they all mesh together and form art. I love that. That's beautiful. I love the way, you know, artists often play with scale. And I feel like you do that to like a, a pattern that maybe you see from above and then you see it more microscopically, you know, blowing up things, shrinking them down. Yeah. Um, in fact, back to San Marco. <laughs> when I went upstairs one year, I saw this unbelievable herringbone pattern, chevron. And I said, oh my God, they were so hot with their chevrons. It was so amazing. And we've used that chevron inspired by that floor in so many different patterns that we've created. It's amazing. But outside of um, Versailles and in, in outside of Paris, there's this great floor that's outside and the scale of it is huge. And then back to um, the... Oh God, why am I blanking on it? Victoria and Albert in London. The yeah. same sort of pattern is on the floor at the Victoria and Albert in London. So we took that pattern and we did it in glass tile in it, sort of a medium size, a, a little bit different from either of them and named it hip to be square. <laughs> That's a fun one. I love that. You could use it in so many different ways. Yes, you can. And of course, since it's glass and it's wall only, we had to do a stone, hip to be stone, to correspond with it as well. And what are you seeing in colors right now? I mean, for a long time, people were kind of playing it safe. Are people coming back to color? I know that you, you love your color. I do, and my color is blue. People are, I think our grounding color, there's always a grounding color. I think our grounding color is going to remain white so there is a bit of a movement back to beige, which mm -hmm. was the grounding colors of the 80s and 90s was beige only. But with white as the grounding color, we're seeing a lot of blues, a lot of lilacs, and a lot of greens. So some people like it strong, and some people like just a touch of it. Mm -hmm. So we have a collection that spans all different patterns, and we named it FET. So we have, whenever we use the word fit, it's multicolors. So if you love the color purple, but you don't want too much of it, if you love green, but you're afraid to use it, everything is rooted in a white background, but there's multiple colors inserted. And then lilac as a color has become really strong as green. And is, is green strong again because We've, we've taken a pause with COVID and we've looked at the world around us and we know that green will be forever. Or has green just always really been there and we're just allowing ourselves to enjoy it again? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it is thrilling to see color come back because designing with only white gets to be hard. I, right. I have a son who came to me to design all of the bathrooms in his house when he built a house. And what color did they like? White. <laughs> they had seven bathrooms. How are we going to do seven different bathrooms in white? We managed, but it's very white. You can make white exciting. I got this in the mail from you recently. And that's uh, a pretty exciting. I mean, I love gold, so that speaks to me. But what a great way to reimagine 
white. It's a great way to reimagine white or black. Or black. Because both of them look so stunning in gold. But put them next to each other for a sec second. I want to show you something. They're quite heavy. But... Yeah, they are. <laughs> so <laughs> if you look closely, you'll see that the way the gold goes onto the white stone is different than the way the gold goes onto the black stone. And we tried and tried for like a year. You can put them down now Ooh. to get them to be the same. But the stone itself affects the way the gold leaf is applied. All right, so well, that's we just, telling you that this is how it's going to be. And that's just what's so exciting about your product is that you're bringing out the best that, that's there already and reinventing it and reimagining it. And that's, that's why it's art. It really is. Yep, and we all need a little gold in our life. So a pattern like that, you can make it with all gold pieces or you can use the underneath the textured part and mm -hmm. just scatter the gold randomly wherever you want it. What are some other new patterns that we have to look forward to? What, what should well, we get excited about? We're coming out with the whole Hudson collection, which is very, it's a Greek key, it's an an octagon or a hexagon, I don't remember which it is. And again, some very simple squares, but the way we've put the stones together, their placement of it, makes it look three-dimensional, although it's flat. And we did everything just in blacks, whites, and grays. We stayed very simple and just worked on the dimensionality that we were being able to achieve by the manipulation of placement of stone. That's incredible. Nancy, everything that you do at Artistic Tile is really a work of art. It's so inspirational to us. And I know it is. It's like Gallery Magazine. Oh, thank you. But really, you let people um, have so many different opportunities to create magic and one of a kind installations in their home, whether it's the bathroom or kitchen or bar or entryway floors. I mean, there's so many opportunities. Um, there are, and there's so much that can be done. And we also, people don't think of us as manufacturers, but in our facility in Secaucus, where we keep all of our slabs and our inventory, we have what are called water jet machines. And water jet machines use high pressure water and garnet to cut stone or metal or glass or ceramic or basically anything. And we can create somebody's totally custom pattern or change one of our stock patterns colors. As we inventory so many more stones than anybody in any other country would have that you may want a purple and a green, one from Turkey, one from Brazil, something from Spain combined together and they'd look gorgeous. But the only place we could possibly make that is here. That's and we do the same with mosaics. I might need a field trip. That would be incredible. So uh, we're field trips here are great fun. <laughs> so where should people find out more about your tile? What's the best place to um, research and see what's, see what's right for them? Well, the website, artistictile.com, is a great source. And our showrooms are all open, most of them by appointment, many of them just by walk-in, with the exception of San Francisco. And there's nothing like seeing, touching, and feeling these products. But if you can't get there or you're hesitant, our website will allow you to order samples. The samples are free and we will make an appointment with you and be in the showroom with you and walk you through all of your different options and help you design that way. We're going to work with however the client feels most comfortable. So inspirational. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you, Artistic Tile. And thank you everyone for joining Gallery Magazine today. I, um, we all really appreciate it.
with more time spent at home, how has design changed during the pandemic? Today, we're sitting down with some top design pros to discuss the impact to design, including how entertaining needs have changed, ways to expand those spaces beyond the kitchen, and how investing in small luxuries can have a big impact. Hey everyone, today I am thrilled to be back with my dear friend, Susie Williford, EVP and Chief Strategy Officer of the National Kitchen and Bath Association. Hello, Susie. How are you? Hi, Cindy. It's <laughs> great to see you again, virtually. I'm doing well, and I'm really excited to have some of our members joining us today to chat about how does design has changed in these last several months and what that means to our members. Um, in our NKBA recent Q2 KBMI report, we found that 93% of the showrooms now are open for business and overall projections for 2020 are really optimistic compared to Q1 figures. That's amazing, by the way. We'd love to hear any good news, you like bring it on. So you have some more. Uh, what else is in that report? Well, I like good news too. Uh, <laughs> of course, while Q2 sales were down from last year, the design segment is reporting a significant improvement in project statuses um, quarter over quarter. 86% of designers report making some level of progress on existing projects that were out there, uh, enabled primarily by virtual meeting and e-design platforms, which I find very interesting. And one in three designers report demand for bids are higher in Q2 than Q1. All of these are very positive signs for the kitchen and bath industry. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm, I'm hearing this ex same exact out in the field. And let's face it, people are spending so much more time at home and all those projects we're putting off are in our faces, right? Absolutely. Uh, whether it could be a new kitchen, a bath remodel, or even outdoor spaces that we want to upgrade, which I've been doing too. Um, and I'm excited to chat with our guests to hear their take. A huge welcome to two long-term members of the NKBA. We have Cheryl Clendenen. Is that right? Did I get that right? You got it right. Good deal. Okay. Um, owner and lead designer in Details Interiors here in Pensacola, Florida. Welcome. And Anna Gibson, AKBD, owner, chief designer, AKG Design Studio. And you're in Great Falls, Virginia. How are you guys? Good. How are you? Haven't seen Cheryl since KBiz, I guess, or all of you since KBiz. So it feels like it was like years ago, but it was just February. <laughs> I know, I know, right? It feels like a <laughs> lifetime ago, but we have those memories, right? Lots of yeah. pictures, lots of pictures. Yeah, yeah, pictures and great memories. Okay, so Cheryl, let's start with you. How has the past few months impacted your business and what kind of challenges and opportunities are you dealing with? Well, I, I will tell you, you know, we were um, closed for two months. You know, I have a retail store and we were closed for two months. So that was, you know, challenging and, and not so fun. Uh, in that regard. But overall, we've been uh, busy. Florida never really stopped construction per se. There was a lot of precautions taken and things, but it was not ever completely mandated to shut down. So we kept going, but obviously um, at a much slower pace and that sort of thing, um, you know, for projects. Now, leads um, have been great since we got back. And even our retail has been really good, which is kind of surprising because the retail is sort of a my retirement plan, you know, <laughs> like I figure I'll focus more on that later. And um, we're set off the road and not seen, but I think people want to shop in maybe smaller places and are maybe feeling the local love kind of deal, you know, or yeah. maybe it's because big places are closed. But overall, we've, um, the biggest challenges have been, um, you know, and we're getting leads when I say that, I don't want to sound like, oh, we're so busy. You know, we, we are really super busy, but we stay busy. But they're not all great leads, but, but what it tells me is that people are willing to spend money, which is good. And also, um, it tells me that, uh, that people are still, you know, people that are, have a pent-up demand for wanting to, to do something to their home. A lot of remodels, a lot of kitchen and bath. We do full right. service, but a lot of kitchen and bathrooms uh, coming up. Um, the biggest challenge, I would say, is finding qualified uh, subs to do the work. Mm -hmm. And man, we protect our subs. We we rub their feet. We cook them dinner. We do everything that we need and to do. Know? The subs, yeah. Whatever, whatever I need, I need to do. And we we take good care of them, and we're we're great to work with. We have a really good reputation with our subs because we give them clear scopes of work. We we do a lot of things that a lot of people should do, but don't mm -hmm. always do. So that would be our probably our biggest challenge is just 
the labor force right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm hearing the same in the field. Anna, um, are you finding the same impacts in your business? Yeah, so just like Cheryl said, uh, we were pretty much since March until June, everything was just pretty much dead. So even though we had projects, uh, everything was a lot of quick people put it on hold, uh, whether uh, some of it was on hold willingly because now they're working from home and all the kids and they just didn't want the, the guys to be in, uh, in the house. Some of them, uh, like some of our DC condo was actually forced on us. Unfortunately, I had a client that was paying mortgage for two units because her building shut down all access to contractor deliveries. So instead of, we have everything ready, we were ready pretty much to roll in. Uh, a couple of days later, everything was already pretty much set for delivery and the building said no. But yeah, it's been really very, very slow until the beginning of August. And then suddenly in August, everybody woke up and everybody just like want all these projects done yesterday. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, you're hearing that again that people are spending a lot of time in their kitchen are are you getting a lot of bids for remodels yes yeah so this is my bread and butter i'm as you said before i'm a certified kitchen and bathroom designer so that's really what mostly i do uh, i don't really do a lot of uh interior decorating so yes kitchen and bathrooms is really what is going on people have been spending a lot of times in their kitchen because they had to cook they didn't want to order food and they realize that, that they don't have enough storage, that they don't have enough space. Uh, and lifestyle really changed. And I think it will be changing as we go be because people realize that they can do all that stuff in their home. I think we're creating kind of almost going back to like, I don't know, almost like a hundred years ago when like everything was done at home, right? All of us are growing vegetables and herbs and really trying to be self-sustained. And we want to have the spaces in our home to do that. So maybe if, if it's a spa bathroom, because you can't go to the gym or the local spa, wherever it's a better kitchen, so you can prep your veggies that you just brought from your garden. So, and of course, like everybody else is that workspaces. So we've talked about a long time that di dining room are dying, but now it's kind of, they're being revitalized as office spaces. Yeah, so a lot of the spaces are, their purpose is changing because, because everything that's still going on. So it's very interesting to see how people utilize the spaces and how we can help them make it happen. Hey Susie, I hear that you recently went through a kitchen remodel. So mm -hmm. I'm curious as to your, like must haves in your own kitchen? Well, on a functional part about it, my kitchen was, you know, 20 years old and I'm a, I love to cook. Um, and it seems like over the years with my travel schedule, I really haven't cooked. I've done more food assembly. So mm -hmm. it was important for me to go back to, to really cooking. So I wanted some new appliances and I wanted to be able to be able to find the stuff that um, I, I had, but I wasn't using. Keeping right. in mind, I'm in the over 50 club, right? So um, getting down on the floor to look in the back of a cabinet is a real pain in the neck. <laughs> getting down isn't so much trouble. It's getting back up that's so much trouble. <laughs> so I took out all the cabinets on the bottom and everything, everything is a drawer so that um, I can get to everything I couldn't get to before. I just open the drawers and I see stuff that was tucked in the back of the cabinet. That was very, very important to me. Second thing that was very important to me were some full length cabinets all the way to the countertop mm -hmm. so I could hire, I could hide the stuff I don't like. And then um, I think the other most important part is a much larger island because I like to stand and wrap gifts and at Christmas time, wrapping gifts is a big deal to me and I wanna use it for that. Yeah, I love that. That uh, all sounds fabulous. Okay, so it's kind of a two-parter, right? So that's like the, the kind of new functionality for you in the kitchen. And there's this other piece, which we call the icing on the cake, those special little luxuries 
that push a project over the top. So tell us about what little luxuries you wanted in your kitchen. Crystal. Uh -oh. I love crystal. I love crystal anything. I, don't, I like anything that sparkles. So I wanted some crystal chandeliers. And so I put two beautiful crystal chandeliers over the island and a new crystal chandelier over my kitchen table. Honestly, God, it looks like the crystal palace. I just love it. And then I wanted glass on uh, quite a few of the cabinets and my ceilings are 11 feet. So I have 16 cabinets on the top that are from 10 foot to 11 foot so that I could show some of the things I've collected over the years or the kids have given me or heirlooms. Um, so those are the things that really were exciting to me are those just those little functional things. They're not really functional, they're just fun. Oh, and yeah. then, I, then a bar cabinet where I could, uh, a different color bar cabinet I built on a wall so that my liquor isn't hidden. It's kind of like out there um, and it looks more hospitable. Anyway, it's just, it, I'm just over the top. Speaking of bar, Cheryl, I hear that you com you recently completed a gorgeous home bar and wine lounge. Uh, a tell wine about lounge. That's what I like to call it, a wine lounge. That's my yeah. that's my new my new thing right now. Is trying like to get that. everybody to have a wine lounge. <laughs> it's it's adjacent to the kitchen, so you want it to be right there, you know, amongst everything. Because I think we still all say this, and and I had a client last night at five o'clock that said the same thing. Everybody wants to come in my, you know, eight by 10 kitchen, you know, we need to be have it bigger. So I wanted to make sure it was near the kitchen. So it's, it's adjacent to the kitchen, but it's also um, a lounging area so that you could actually, you know, talk to the cook when their cook is on the other side, but it's uh, four big chairs, um, wine built in a great place for a plum wine dispenser. You could put that in there. Um, books. There's nothing better than wine and books, right? I mean, you know, it's just, helps everything taste and taste better. I think, you know, I, I love uh, libraries with, with, uh, with wine in them. And so it's kind of like a wine lounge slash library type of, um, type of uh, setup with a lot of original art and very personal. My thought was, and I'm doing another one right now too. As a matter of fact, um, when I was preparing for getting on the call, I texted her really quickly and said, you know, we really have to do this. Like, I'm so excited about this truck because we have a meeting with her later today. So I wanted to get her pumped up. And it's the same idea It's taking an, her parents' library and now her parents have passed away and she has the house and we are opening it up to the kitchen more, just like the one that um, we're talking about. And we are making it um, into a gathering place. So, so if you can't go out to a bar and I haven't been out, I mean, let's face it, I don't really go out to bars anyway, but even going out to a, a lounge type of bar hasn't been done since March 17th when they closed everything here. Right. And so I think you bring it into your house, right? And, and uh, that way you could have smaller gatherings of people and, and you could sit around and make it comfortable and lots of ways to do that. And just make sure that you have uh, your bar there and your copious amounts of wine and lots of books and things to talk about and, you know, and no media whatsoever. No media, no, no TV, none of that. You know, that was the first thing she said, well, can I have a little TV? No, mm -mm. no, that's Can't it. No, no, no TV, no TV. And you know what? We're going to do a force field around it and no cell phones in there. Nothing. Maybe a little bit going back to talking to one another right. might be kind of a novel concept, right? right. Very novel. So, yeah, well, I, love it. I love that. So yeah, we're very excited about both of them. Yeah. And I hear that you also installed a home bar complete with an integrated beer dispenser. Uh, yeah, tell us about that one. We actually done several projects like that. It seems that my client are definitely a lot of them are beer lovers. Uh, my, one of my clients actually own a microbrewery here in the area. And again, it's some of the things that it may be a hobby that people kind of just picked up during the COVID. It's fantastic because you have a great space that you can host, like Cheryl said, small gathering or just really enjoy it yourself. So I find it really, really fun. Uh, this was a great project with a lot of recycled material. So we opened all the main floors, so it's actually all flows in one space. There was a whole lot of walls, and it was very uh, congested nice. area. Yeah, and we reused actually all the cabinetry for uh, for the existing kitchen, uh, and then we found that the beautiful recycled skateboards, and it really created a really fun play with colors uh, in that space. But we do find that a lot of people are looking for those little things. Uh, wine coolers, we always add them, whether it's in the island 
or in some space in the house, again, creating that little space, even just for yourself, but you can enjoy a cold beverage. You don't necessarily need to run all the way to the kitchen. So tell me about that. So first of all, I'll drink to everything you just said. And then like, tell me about other kinds of spaces that you're incorporating into some sort of like entertaining. Uh, coffee station, I think they're becoming really, really popular. Uh, whether it's a small home, uh, and I, at that point, we, we do kitchen. I like to create overflow somewhere outside of the kitchen. So we add a coffee machine and usually a wine cooler somewhere outside of the kitchen, maybe in the family room, maybe in the dining room. Uh, even in the master, depends on the size. If you have everything handy in your bedroom and you have a coffee that you can just roll out of bed leisurely, uh, get a cup of coffee if, if instead of running all the way downstairs. Um, a glass of wine to relax in your bathtub. I think those are what creates a little bit of the luxury. And then if you don't really have a lot of space, uh, we all saw that awesome plum wine cooler at KBiz. And this is such a small machine that can just really stand even on your dresser and all you need is a glass of wine next to it and you're ready to go. So it's a great way to incorporate small little luxuries throughout the house and not necessarily just in the kitchen. Yeah, I was just talking to a designer in Toronto and she had just finished putting a coffee station into a home office. So it's happening, right? It's definitely <laughs> happening. So Cheryl, we're, we discussed how the consumer needs are changing and spending habits we know are too. So even though overall budgets have declined a little bit, consumers are investing in those little luxuries that we're talking about for these high-end small appliances. So what are the best practices for incorporating these little luxuries into your design? Well, I think, I think the first thing is you really have to get to know your, your uh, customer and draw that out of them, what really turns them on. Like something that's really gonna be a non-starter for them. They're saying, I absolutely have to have this. Because a lot of clients, they don't have time to do what we do and study this 24 seven. You know, I know of every new gadget and widget and thingamajig that comes out. And, um, and so that's why they hire us. And it's, it's now more important than ever. If I can just, uh, you know, interject this, uh, I think for consumers to have a designer to really come out and, and help them with it. I'm really trying to find out what it is that is so important to them, you know, that they are going to do it. And I think that's the key thing is to really make sure, you know, you find out. So I think speaking to what y'all were talking about earlier, Cindy, really targeting the home and, and redesign, really rethinking the purpose of every space. And, and Susie talked about it too, about she wanted targeted storage. That's what I call it, it was targeted storage. And she wanted that, so it was very important to her to have that, and the crystal was important. I have another client that, um, talking about little luxuries, that um, fell in love with, because I showed it to her, because I fell in love with it first, you know, I have to love it first. Uh, yeah, a beautiful Thompson Trader sink with a touchless faucet, Jason Wu touchless faucet from Brizo, and oh man, I mean, these sinks are absolutely gorgeous, and they make the bathroom. I mean, that's really, truly, it, it's, a, it's a riot of a lot of textures and color and all of that. But, the, but the, the shining piece of architectural elegance in the room are those, are those sinks. Right. And she says she won't even let anybody else. This woman is a professional woman and has, you know, a, a plenty of people to do things for her. And she says, I, I want to clean those. I want to be able to clean those sinks myself, you know, <laughs> because right. they're so important to me. It's like, it's like Susie's crystal, you know, it's right. so important to her to have that. So I think that, um, that that's really important right now is not just the little luxuries, but also finding out what that luxury is, right. what that means and defined by the client, right? And I think that they need us more. And this is what I'm discovering with all the calls, even the, the lower budget um, uh, projects that they really need somebody to say, you know, I've always, all this time in my house has made me think I really want a such and such, or I know it's crazy, but I want a door going outside to my outdoor kitchen from the kitchen, you know? Call me weird, but I, that's what I want. And I'm like, okay, we can do that, you know? I mean, so it's, it's, I think, people spending more time, and we are too. I live on the beach, and it's hot in Florida. But it's, um, you know, we are now looking and investing in more of an outdoor kitchen per se, as opposed to just the green egg and the grill, you know, and, um, right. and really trying to make it. And that's where 
I feel comfortable spending my money. Um, and if I feel comfortable with it, then my clientele who are a lot like me, busy professionals are also going to feel comfortable spending their money there. But other people, you know, have different things. I have a, a Blanco uh, sink that's actually raised up that I saw at Cologne, Germany a million years ago before uh, that, that Blanco had it in the States. So, you know, there's, when that came out, I had to have that sink. And that sink, I lovingly clean it too. <laughs> I don't want my husband to clean it, you know? So it's just little things like that make a difference to people and you have to figure out what that is for them. Yeah, I like, I like what you said. It's, it's not just what it is, but what, it, what is right for your client. Right. And that's your job as a designer. And I love that you're like being more sensitive about it right now because everyone is so different, stuck in their own homes. And you have to ask, here's my philosophy on that. Yeah. You have to ask the right questions to get the right answers. So we have at one, one tip to anybody that's listening is to really rework your questionnaire to clients and really dig down on that. And that's a really good way because all of us have questionnaires we've used for years, right? I mean, let's face it. So if you really right now, re, re look at that and think about it in a different way based on everything that's going on, it really gives us a great opportunity to make 2020 into a, a great thing and not such a rotten year you know You're right it's going to be the it's going to be the year whatever yeah. that means right whatever that means yeah right so so Susie I'm curious about what changes in design might be coming out of the pandemic do you have any more information from all that great NKBA research uh, actually I do you know Cindy over the five months that you and I've been doing this yeah um I was just sitting here thinking about how resilient the design community is I know. because of the enthusiasm and what everybody talks about now, as opposed to what they talked about in March. I mean, this is good stuff. It's exciting. Right. And Cheryl compliment you on, on making that wine area a, a no TV area. I've never had a TV in my family room, a uh, gathering room, the one for you. Where, never because it's always been like let's talk you know let's have a let's have a nice time I don't want anybody trying to watch a football game where all we're trying to tell a story but out of our most recent KBMI um, they address the changes that have come out of this pandemic and one thing that's interesting is we're finding that a lot of homeowners now are requesting health related features in their remotes um, the top request according to our research is for air purifiers uh, cited by 68% of the responders, which is really very high. Yeah. And half of those surveyed said that touchless faucets and, and antimicrobial door handles are seeing increased demand because we found that people want things that are easier to keep clean and to be sanitized. And so low maintenance materials and surfaces are becoming much more important to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's face it. Clean air is, is key, but the words that we're hearing all the time is hygiene and touchless, right? You guys. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, that's always been, but I think it, now it's even more, you want to have that. And especially when you just walk straight into the house, whether it's a power or the kitchen, whatever is the first room that you have in the house that you can just walk in immediately and wash your hands and Cheryl, I hear that you have a multi-generational story to share with us. Oh, yeah. My tiny house. Is that yeah. what we're talking about? Yeah. yeah. yeah, the tiny house. yeah. Great. It's great. It's very exciting. Um, so it's, it's not a house I live in because I live on the beach. And, uh, but the, um, it was a house I own. And my older daughter lives there. And uh, my, both my daughters work for the firm. And um, my oldest daughter wants to be a writer. So she doesn't really want to work for the firm. But it allows her the freedom to be able to do things. And she does our bookkeeping. My other designer is she's sitting for her AKBB, actually. Um, also, Susie, you'll be so proud, right? Yeah. That she's doing, um, sitting for her AKBD. Um, and uh, this house is um, really, what I did was I took the backyard. It's on a corner. I took the backyard and I split it in half so that uh, it's, there's a fence, you know, there. So it looks like a separate house, but the, the city wouldn't let me do it. It's an ADU, which I think is a very, we've been talking about ADUs um, getting a, an accessory dwelling unit, getting more and more traction for uh, several, for probably at least a year and a half or so because there's a housing crisis, right? So um, this, this house we built uh, and it was just, it was so much fun to do. It's 525 square feet and um, we vaulted the seal. Both my daughters are six foot one. So we, we vaulted the ceilings to give them a little more headroom and to have a little storage uh, loft up at the top. And um, also, you know, 
pe people could sleep up there if her friends came over. But you know, it's great. And of course it focused around the kitchen because she loves to cook and, uh, and dining, but you can get comfortably 10 people in there to eat dinner. Um, it's really been so much fun and it was very budget oriented. Uh, people don't really talk about that, but um, we used really uh, budget oriented items because you don't have the, um, the, the idea, you know, you, it's more per square foot because you don't have economy of scale like you would a regular house. Um, but I think it's really good at, right now to think about this because so many people, including myself, are worried about their, their, um, their families being in right. nursing homes for obvious reasons. It opens up sort of a new category, sort of like the Airbnb became a new category of design. It opens up a new category and um, they can be very affordable if with the right kitchen and bath designer, they oh, yeah. really can work miracles and make them look really great. I would love to do more and see more of people mm -hmm. doing this because I think it's a, it fills a great need. And right now this is very timely because of COVID and because of wanting to keep your parents uh, nearby. And, um, and this is a little neighborhood so people could walk to places, you could walk to the store, you could walk all over the place and, and uh, you know, that sort of thing. So it was a really exciting project for us to do. I bet it was. And you know, 550 square feet is not that small for a tiny house. Like yeah. it feels like it can work. And I bet your daughter's thrilled. Oh, she loves it. She absolutely, she really does love it. It's, and, it and it was great for her because she's one of our newest designers. Um, she's been there about a year after working out of college for a couple of years for a furniture company. And she, um, I let her follow this process all along. So I tell you one thing, there's great training, right, Susie, to have somebody build a house, you know, even if it's a tiny house. She had to go through every step and make decisions and all that. And of course, I was right there and I designed the, the overall uh, you know, layout and all of that. But she did a lot of the um, interior work and all of that. But she also had to interface with subs and talk to them because it was our main contractor. So it was a great learning experience for her too. So I, I like a good two for one. So <laughs> you know, this was like three or four for one, I think. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. Um, Anna, what changes in design do you think are here to stay? I think people are really trying to encapsulate their home uh, and everything, like I said before, that is really going to be almost self-sufficient. Uh, so I think some of the trends that we're going to see is much more storage, again, for all the, the food hurting. Uh, we live in the D.C. area. It's very common. Uh, every time that there's rain and storm or any type of wet weather, the, it's always the rush for the wine, toilet paper, and <laughs> so, uh, so I think that trend, especially now enhanced by COVID, is, uh, is here to stay. Uh, a lot of companies are removing their offices. They realize how much they're going to save on not paying rent. So way more people are going to be working from home. I'm hoping that the kitchen table and the dining room are gonna get some revival because now we're everybody's together eating. I know in my house, it came from eating one day a week. Now we're almost every night eating together. Uh, the fact that more people are cooking also together because you need to entertain the kids. And honestly, as the one person that in charge, no matter who it is, at some point you're tired, right? Like cooking every day. So you, you have to kind of like bring in those sous chef and bring those assistants. And then just like Susie touched on all these health things. So whoever bringing uh, the, I, I see a big uh, revival of the jets. I know for a while it seemed like they, people were not really paying attention to those, but we'll see. We see the steam and the jets coming back into the home because people want to have that spa, the relaxation, the big bathtubs that they want in their home so they can just relax there and they don't have to go anywhere. And I think those, those are really here to stay. And even when the world still opens up, I think we're still going to stay a little bit, maybe one step slower, maybe a little bit uh more relaxed lifestyle i hope so and really bring all these items into our home versus going out to do it all the time as you talk about the whole you know the whole world in your home what are what are some of the items that'll get you there so uh again there's a lot of people that 
creating gyms in their home. So you're bringing that, that steam shower, the jet, uh, your own really awesome coffee machine that creates your, you know, high level coffee cappuccinos, just like you will get if you go out to a nice coffee uh, store. Uh, I think a lot of the appliances that create better baking, maybe appliances that have some steam in them as well. I keep saying steam, I feel. <laughs> a lot of steam, steam, a lot of steam. <laughs> um, so appliances that really create those very delicate and really fun things that you're going to create for, for yourself and you don't have to go necessarily to the cake store you can just make it at home right. so again just the small little luxuries like the plum wine dispenser uh we have so much fun with it uh in cavis and it's like it just right there all you need just a glass of wine uh next to it and you're good to go and you can even keep it outside you can really you can keep it on your desk i'm gonna put it by my nightstand that no you know, plum plum that one best to cavis this year Oh, it did. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay, so we're out of time, guys. Listen, thank you, Anna and Cheryl, for sharing your terrific projects and your thoughts on the design for the future. We need it. Um, it's great to hear that business is picking up. Fantastic. Yay. Thanks for all that great research, Susie. And about the new opportunities for the K&B industry as consumers' needs have evolved over these last six months. It's insane. Thank you to my dear friend, Susie, for joining us as well. It's always a pleasure. Stay well, everybody. I think we should drink to that one. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. God Absolutely. bless you all. Good, good energy out there for the industry, right? Yeah. Good. All yeah. right. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Sure. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. 